church, would we turn to him in all the things we go through in life, from the smallest to the largest? Lord, would you lift us up, God? Encourage our hearts, God. Give us peace now. We're here because we're not giving up. We need you, Lord. We want to praise you as a community, but we also want to lean on your power as a community. We focus on your presence right now. You're in your presence. You're building our faith to trust, trust you a little more, to trust you a little more. Each day that goes on, we're going to be in the middle of your presence, and our faith is going to grow so that when the storms come and the waves come, we can keep our heads above water because you're holding us there. So we just thank you, Lord, for what you're doing right now. I believe you're speaking to spirits right now. I believe you're mending hearts. God, I believe you're restoring families. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, would you guys say thank you right now? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm not sure how your day was going before you got here. But you're in the, in the middle of the presence of God because you walked in here. This church is not special because of the building. It's special because you walked in through the doors. The Lord resides and the presence of God is with you. And we're in the middle right now. Right now. And I pray that when you leave, you will leave a little differently. Because we're having a real experience with God. A real encounter with the living God. So amen, amen. Would you guys stay standing? Because we're going to do something incredible. We're going to baptize some folks. So would you just cheer for these awesome people? First, we have Lakshmi coming in. Lakshmi is one of my great student leaders at Outbreak. Let's give it up for Lakshmi. She's going to be baptizing another amazing student in my ministry. Amanda, Amanda, would you come in? Woo, yeah, let's give it up. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Amen. Amen. Now I'm going to be calling a young adult leader. Tony, Tony, would you come in? Let's give it up for Tony. Woo. Tony now has been committed to my uh, youth ministry now for a few months and been a tremendous blessing. So now we're going to call Sorrell in. So excited. Woo. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You get a little bit more glory if you spend a little bit extra seconds in the water. That's what happened. He just wants to stay down a little bit. Awesome. Well, church, I'm encouraged by you and being here. It's this morning, we're going to continue worshiping.
grateful. We're grateful, Lord God. We give you praise. We give you praise. We worship you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, church. Lift your voice. Lift your voice in praise. Lift your voice in adoration. Let us give God praise. He's worthy. We magnify your name, Lord God. We magnify your name. Innovation Church. Come on, let's let's give. Let's give it a Good morning. My name is Mark. You may have a seat. We'd like to take this opportunity to welcome uh, those first-time visitors to Innovation Church. Again, if this is your first time visiting with Innovation Church or first time in a while, I'll let you define that. We want to say welcome. We're so glad that you took the opportunity to visit with us, and we're grateful for that. There's a connect card in the front of the chair, in the back of the chair in front of you. It looks something like this. I would ask that you would kindly fill that out. And um, during uh, the offering, when, it's, when the basket is going by you, if you would take the opportunity and put that in, we'd love to have a record of your visit. Amen? Amen. Thank you so much. Also, there's a surf table at the front in the lobby, and we want to encourage you. And this is for everyone. First time in a while. You've been here forever. You laid the foundation of Innovation Church. We're so glad for that, but we want to remind you that, hey, there's a surf table, and the purpose of this table is for us as a body, amen, is to remind us of the various opportunities here at Innovation Church. And I want to encourage you to take a look, and, and you know, there are various classes, there's various things occurring here each week. And as I mentioned in the first worship experience, if there's something that just does not align with you and you have some special gifts or, or talents, Hey, let's go ahead and mention that to the f folks that are um, leading that table and say, hey, listen, I have some gifts. I have something that I would like to, you know, idea, a group or something I would like to start. And the key word is you would like to start. Amen. Because <laughs> the pastors and the leaders, um, we, we, we want to support you. We want to come and, and say, hey, how can we help you use your gifts and your talents? Amen. So if there's something that you would like to do, let us know and we will support you. Amen. Once again, thanks for, for uh, visiting with Innovation Church. Morning, everybody. How are you? Wonderful. Good. Hey, that was a little video tease coming up next week. The series "Safe People." We're pretty excited about it. It's one of those things where we all look at it and we start to think, "Man, I, I, I know some of those people," <laughs> but I'm sure Pastor will will uh, clarify a little bit, and hopefully, God's word will be spoken right to our hearts. Amen. Amen. I don't know. <laughs> Something. Hey, listen, I'm Josh. I'm the associate pastor here at the church. I'm glad you all are here. I just want to tell you about a few of the things going on this week and coming up in the next few weeks as we enter into summer. How awesome is summer? Oh, I love summer. It's such a beautiful thing for all of the three days we have it in the Poconos. And so uh, we should celebrate all three of those days starting tomorrow with uh, our women's sorority meeting tomorrow, 7 o'clock, with their covered dish dinner. And they are having a special summertime contest, or a recipe contest. You, you know, they always bring a food, bring a dish, bring something. And this time they're having a summertime dish contest for the best tasting and the best looking summertime dish. I don't know what that means, but apparently you all do. What, what's a summertime dish? Food. That is so non-helpful. Someone said food. Like a watermelon? Like, is that it? What, what's a summertime dish? Under 30 minutes. It's a time thing. Okay, under 30 minutes. That's helpful. That's helpful. I don't know what it is, 
But, you know, I hope that you guys bring good food. Again, women's sorority, I don't know. Tomorrow, 7 o'clock, and I want to encourage you, women, to invite your friends. It's an incredible opportunity to invite someone to church. And how many of you know sometimes Sunday morning is fairly difficult to get someone to come out to church on a Sunday morning, but to hang out with other women who just want to fellowship and spend time together and bring some good food, that's much easier. And so I'd encourage you to invite your friends, invite your neighbors, other women around you, and they don't need to bring anything. They get free food. Isn't that great? Beautiful thing. Everyone wants free food. So again, tomorrow, 7 o'clock. Uh, I want to make an announcement towards my young family group. That's the group of young families that meets at my house at every Tuesday. We are taking our summer hiatus coming after this Tuesday, so we've got one more meeting, one more gathering, and then we're going to take the summer off as we typically do. Uh, but if that's something that you are here and you're interested in, you haven't been a part of that group, but you say, hey, we're young or relatively young, and we have maybe small kids, or we're getting married, or we're newly married, or who knows what, somewhere in the, I don't know, 18 to 35-ish range, we've got some 40s, I don't know, we're, we're, we're slowly pushing the bounds of young. But that's okay. We're, we're having a good time. As long, young kids is important, whatever the case may be. But if you're not a part of it and you want to be and you're bummed out because, hey, we're not meeting for a few months, uh, let me know still. Come talk to me. Find me. I want to invite you. We're going to be getting together socially, having some big family barbecues, things like that. And so either way, Young Families Group, after this next Tuesday, will be taking off summer hiatus. And how many of you know the incredible Yoder family? Yeah? Supporters of the Yoder family in the room? Tori and Dana, and of course their three kids, but we've been having uh, conversations, obviously, about little Christopher, who is Superman. You guys, I'm sure, all know Superman. You follow him on Facebook, see his wonderful pictures. He had surgery at age, I guess, six, seven months old, had heart surgery, and we, of course, supported and prayed for him, and another church in our area decided, hey, we need to have like a fundraising dinner for the Yoders, and so they did that, and a lot of you supported it and were there, uh, but then a few of our church members heard about that and said, wait, what? Wait, no, no, no. Not, another church can't support our family more than we support our family. And so they're throwing another dinner coming up in two weeks on Sunday, uh, June 14th, right after the second service. And there is more at this barbecue than I could imagine. I was so shocked when I started looking at the list. It's after second service. It's a Wild West hoedown. And they have pulled pork platters, uh, which you have to buy, but then they have free moon bounces for kids, face painting, pony rides, dunking tank, um, line dancing lessons, uh, lots and lots of stuff. And either way, it's all, all free, and then you just pay for some food to support the odors, and everything will go to their continued medical expenses, as there are several surgeries still to come for Christopher. And so we want to support them, and I just want to make you aware of that. We'll have some flyers, I think, out for it next week, but that is Sunday, June 14th, right after the second service. Another thing coming up in a few weeks, Monday, June 22nd at 7 o'clock, is the next Vision Night. Do you guys remember the Vision Night we had here on a Monday? I guess it was in March, where we gather as a church, and the entire night is just focused on worshiping God, praying together as a church, and a little bit of teaching regarding who we are and where we're going. It's really important. We want to keep you guys in the loop about who we are and where we're going. And so the next Vision Night is scheduled for Monday, June 22nd, 7 o'clock. It's a fun night full of incredible worship, incredible time of prayer together, just learning to be one body. Amen? And so I'd encourage you guys to put that on your calendar. Uh, I've got a note here about Father's Day coming up in, I guess, three, four weeks, something like that. Don't forget your fathers. I say this personally because we make a big deal for moms. And then what do we get? What do the dads get, you know? And so either, I have no idea what I'm talking about. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. My family, Allison always does an incredible job supporting me and remembering me. This is not focused at you. I love you. Um, <laughs> see, you guys see how to do that? I'm giving lessons here. You guys can take notes. Um, but Father's Day is in a few weeks. We just want to honor them. Of course, we'll do so that Sunday, but just a reminder. Also, uh, Wednesday night thing, a lot of transition, a lot of things happening. Wednesday nights, we've been meeting, doing our life groups, been doing a young adult class on Wednesdays, been doing the Book of Romans with Pastor Charles. Lots of different things happening, all of which have been great. Those are coming to a close in the next two to three weeks. Uh, Romans, I believe, ends in about two weeks. The other classes, I think, have three weeks left. And then after that, we wanted to make you aware that we're going to be starting one class, one combined group, if anyone is interested, in a Wednesday night adult class through the summer. It's going to be starting on June 24th. I'm going to be leading it, and I don't know what I will be sharing yet, but it'll be good. It'll be really good. So if you want to hang out with me on Wednesdays and study God's Word together, get to know each other better, you are more than welcome to come starting June 24th, Wednesdays, 7 o'clock. We'll probably meet for about six weeks, 
a little bit shorter than normal because it is the summer and I want to be aware of everybody's, you know, schedules, vacations, all the fun stuff that we do in the summer months. Amen? Cool. Listen, we're going to get ready to give back to God and collect the tithes and an offering. And before we do, I wanted to share a scripture with you from First Chronicles. It should show up on the screen there. It says, Lord our God, as for all this abundance that we have provided for building you a temple for your holy name, it comes from your hand and all of it belongs to you. I love that we have what we have here at Innovation. I love our building. I love the church. I love the band. I love music. I love the kids' ministries we offer. I love that we can even do, you know, dinner fundraisers for people in need in the church and different things. I love what we can do to support the family and the community here at Innovation Church. And this is a reminder that all of it, every little thing that we do, comes from him, comes from God. He is our provision. And so as we get prepared to give back to him, I just want to remind you that it's always his. Everything we have belongs to our God, and our desire is to be faithful in response to him. So we're going to pray over that offering here in just a second. We're also going to be praying for a local church in our community, the Reformed Church over in Bushkill. We're going to lift them up this morning, and also a couple of our missionaries to the Ukraine, Gerald and Jane Dollar. So if you would bow your heads, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your great provision in our personal lives, in our finances, and also as a church, Lord, we thank you for your provision. We thank you for blessing us with all of the incredible things that we have and allowing us to use them to worship you. Lord God, I pray right now that every cent that comes in this offering, every gift, every sacrifice, Lord God, I pray that you would specifically anoint it to go to saving souls, that it would be useful in expanding your kingdom and nothing else. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you that we can take part in the expansion of your kingdom. We thank you that we can take part in the blessing of your sons and your daughters. And Lord God, I thank you also that we exist not in isolation, not alone as a building that we think we are the church, but we exist in such a global church and such a beautiful thing that you've orchestrated on earth. And Lord, we thank you for the Reformed Church over in Bushkill this morning. We thank you that we work alongside them, that they are being faithful to the call you have placed upon them in their hearts. And this morning, we just pray for a blessing over them in their church, over their leadership. God, that you would abundantly bless them as you pour your favor over them. Lord God, that they would have such an impact in their community over in Bushkill. Lord God, just bless them this morning, we pray. And I also think of our missionaries in the Ukraine. I think of Jane and of Gerald. And God, I know that they've given everything in their lives to serve you. They've given their families, their homes, they've left things behind to go and to be in a strange place, a place that is not their home, in order to bring your good news to people who may not otherwise have a chance to hear it, to train up leaders and pastors from the Ukraine who can take that message and make it go further. And Lord, we pray your blessing upon them again this morning. I don't know all of their needs, but I ask that you would meet each and every single one of them. And Lord, for all of these things, for the incredible missionary work that you're doing around the world, for the churches that you've placed here throughout the Poconos, for the finances that you're going to raise this morning, for every good thing we have in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Words fill a page. Pages fill a chapter. Chapters fill a book. Every decision, big and small, writes the story of your life. Unfortunately, some people leave portions of their story unwritten. Sometimes that's why you need to go ahead and take the risk. My story, I decided to go. Good morning. How y'all doing? Um, Next week, we are going to be uh, starting a series entitled Safe People. And uh, I I think you're going to find it interesting. It deals, of course, with relationships. And I want to talk to you throughout that series uh, regarding uh, what constitutes a person that uh, is not safe for you and a person that is safe for you? Or are you that safe person or are you that unsafe person? 
Uh, and, and how do we find out? <clears throat> what's, what's the difference? What are we looking for? Now, I get it that, that we're Christians. We're, we want to follow Christ. We want to live in such a way as to be a blessing and encourage others. I get that. But we also live in a world and in a generation where people are not always safe to us. And one of the things we discover is that we, some of us, make the same mistakes with folks again and again and again. And we find our expectations dashed. We find ourselves injured in some way. And if possible, uh, you know, uh, we, or, or uh, sometimes, uh, sadly, not only if possible, it's very probable that we can become hurt and injured uh, or even offended or resentful. And then that affects us in such a negative way. So we want to really look at that and take a very close look at it throughout that series. So it's coming up next week. There's probably a good series for you to uh, invite that person to that you're thinking of right now. <laughs> I also want to say hi to all of those of you who are joining us online. <clears throat> That's awesome. Thank you for being with us and the family here at Innovation Church. We're going to open in prayer. Let's do that. Father, we thank you for the time we have here this morning. Lord, we thank you for the band. What an awesome ministry. Uh, and Lord, for, the, for, the, uh, for the, uh, those who were baptized today, we pray your blessing upon them, that this would be a day of transition and, and forward motion for them as they place their faith in you. All the old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And then, Lord, for us who are joined together, we make ourselves available to your Holy Spirit, that your word would open up to us in our hearts, and that our hearts would be open to your word. Lord, we commit this time into your hands, and we ask your blessing and the direction of your Holy Spirit, and we ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. <clears throat> well, one day, you're going to tell a story about this season of your life. However old you are, whatever you're going through right now, one day you will tell someone a story about this season of your life. Things that you started, perhaps, new habits, uh, maybe things that you stopped and, and were no longer uh, uh, being discouraged by, or, or when you stayed, when you thought you had to give up. Or, well, hopefully, it will be a story that you're uh, happy uh, and even proud to tell, proud in a good sense, that you're, you're excited and give testimony and glorify God with the story that you can tell in the years to come about what's going on right now in your life. However, knowing what I know, it's possible uh, that uh, human nature being what it is, some of you will not have that story to tell because you're not making decisions today that are going to prepare you for that kind of story in the days ahead. And so this is something worth thinking about. It's worth considering because, again, what you're doing today is going to impact who you are tomorrow. And so let's put that on the screen. This has been uh, the, the primary theme throughout this series as we conclude the series today. And it is this. The decisions you make today determine the stories you'll tell tomorrow about you, about your life, about your family, about, about who you are and what God is doing within you. In fact, would you read that together with me out loud, please? The decisions you make today determine the stories you tell tomorrow. Absolutely essential that we focus in now on what God is doing this moment in our lives and what do we want God to accomplish so we have that story to tell in the years to come? Now, at this point in my life, and maybe in some of you as well, you may sense that there's something more, uh, something new that's going to take place. Maybe you're ready for a step of faith, something that is exciting you, and, and, and the Lord is speaking to you in some way. With that in mind, here's a key thought, also in your notes, if you're taking notes today, but we'll put it on the screen as well. Listen to this. Sometimes the best decision you can make is to go when it would be easier to stay. Sometimes the best decision you can make is to go when it would be easier to stay. I know I've had such seasons in my life. Now, I'm not speaking always of a geographical move, although sometimes it is that. I know that Dawn and I and our children about 15 years ago were absolutely settled and secure. I know that sounds 
uh, you know, unusual in, in our society with all of the challenges everybody's going through and the, and the constant disruption to our lives based on whether it's Wall Street or politics or some other mistake by, by so-called leaders. But we were at a place in our lives where I could see the end of my life and just keep doing what we were doing and we would be uh, stable and secure and safe and, and fairly comfortable. We were pastoring a church in Virginia, right on Virginia Beach. We lived right near the oceanfront. <clears throat> it was a great place to be. And uh, <clears throat> I was, uh, and I still am, but then I was practicing more uh, hours at least as a therapist, as a counselor, uh, licensed counselor. And, uh, and we looked at our lives, you know, with three great kids, and they all love the Lord, and they say, this is it, we're done. We, we've arrived. And, and we kind of saw the decades ready to unfold in front of us. And I remember on, on an evening when I was thinking this very thing, that I looked at my wife and I said, honey, I feel trapped. Isn't that weird? I said, I feel trapped. I said, we can't be done. You know, you spend your whole life at least I did, and maybe some of you will identify uh, as a young person thinking about what you're going to do next. What's the next challenge? What's the he next hill you're going to climb? What's the next mountain you're going to go after? What's the next, uh, you know, difficult situation that you're going to take on? And now we're thinking, well, we're done. Everything's cool. We got this lovely home. We got the kids. We got the, you know, the two and a half kids. Well, three. You know, we had a little dog. We had the, you know, all of the stuff that that people think about when they're young. I'm saying, honey, I feel trapped. I feel like, how, how can it be over? And right as I was thinking, and by the way, that's silly. That's crazy. I get that. I'm just being honest with you. I'm just being honest. That's where I was. I'm not saying anyone else would have to feel that way. It's just how I felt at that moment. And I think it's because there was something churning in me. God was preparing me for something because that very week, phone call, there's a church, and they're really looking for someone, and your name has come up. Would you consider it? And that's this ministry, and I've been here for 15 years. Well, you don't need to, you don't need to applaud. Oh, I heard some booing. Okay, that's a, no, I don't. No, but, you know, we've been here now going on 15 years, or going into our 15th year. We're very thankful to be here. Uh, and it was new challenges, and it's exciting. And, and coming here, all of our children met their spouses. One of them met uh, her spouse uh, the very first year we got here. And she was only 15 years old. And her husband came up to me one day. This is not in my sermon, but I can't help it because he's sitting over there. He has on his best suit and tie. And we sat right about over here. And, and he said, Pastor, and he was, I guess, maybe 17. And my daughter's 15. And I, 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 he says, uh, Pastor. He should have said Reverend. He would have been better off. He said, Pastor. <laughs> He said, I would like to, I would like to uh, 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 date, your, date your daughter. And my answer was, no, and maybe later. <laughs> no, she's too young, she's not dating, but maybe later, just hang in there. And of course, how long you guys been married now? Seven years, you sure? You got that, do you need to look at the inside of your ring? <laughs> you got it right there, I know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And, and two great kids, uh, grandkids, and then my other kids all have kids. We've got six grandchildren, two more coming. None of that would have happened if we'd stayed where we were. Now, I get that. Everybody's story is different, but I love telling the story. It's my story based on that season, based on a decision we made. And in this case, it had to do with a geographical change. It's not always that, as I'm going to dis describe to you as I go through this short teaching. But how do we live the story worth telling? the story that you want to tell. Now, one thing we've been saying throughout the series is, is ask God to help write your story. Amen? Ask God to get involved. Some of you have never done that. Listen to the author of the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, chapter 12, verse 2. We've been quoting this in every one of these messages. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. So there is an author, there's a, there's a director, there's someone who's writing behind the scenes. When the Lord says to us, I will work all things together for good in your life if you will love, have a love, an authentic love relationship with me and live according to the purpose and, and the plan I have for you, 
I'm going to work all things together for good. I'm going to bring everything to pass according to my desire for you and according to the deepest desires of your heart. And he said, but I, I'm the author. You're not the author. I'm the author, the Lord says to us. So let God help write the story. And in this series, with that in mind, we've been looking at four decisions we need to make. One is I decided to start. And we talked about starting maybe the simplest of a, a, a thing, maybe just a new habit. But that will lead to something else, which leads to something else, which leads to something else. It helps us begin to grow as the Lord desires us to grow. Uh, the second one message was I decided to stop. And that is maybe there's a behavior that, you know, if you had to tell the story five years from now, ten years from now, you would leave that part out. Well, maybe it's time to stop that behavior or stop that action or, or stop that decision or whatever it may be because it's holding you back. And you want to have a story that you can be able to tell to others in the years ahead to literally be an open book that the Holy Spirit is writing and you don't have to hide anything. The third message was I decided to stay. Uh, you were ready to give up, but as they used to say, you got to the end of your rope, you tied a knot in it, and you hung on, and the Holy Spirit helped you grow through that challenging time. Today, the message is, I decided to go. I decided to go when it would have been easier to stay. There are those seasons in our lives where we take on a new challenge and we take a step of faith. And one of the greatest examples in all of the scripture and probably all of life is a man named Abraham. Abraham uh, is given to us by the Holy Spirit to consider his life, consider the choices he made, so we can look at our own lives and say, Lord, what are you saying to me? Now, Abraham was not originally called by that name. His name was Abram, and God changed his name. His wife's name was Sarai, and God changed it to Sarah. Uh, and so when God changes a name, he's going to change the direction or course of your life. Uh, when Simon becomes Peter, it's because the direction of his life is about to change. And so here is something that's happening in Abram's life. God is going to call him out of his very wealthy family. He's 75 years of age. He's fully established. Uh, he lives in a place called Ur the Chaldees. He's... Uh, it's a capital of idolatry. They worshipped and devoted themselves to what was called the moon god. Uh, and in that environment, he had done very well. And God speaks to him. We don't know how, but the Lord speaks into his heart. Could have been a dream, could have been verbally. Uh, it could have just been in his thoughts. But God gets through to him, and here's how we understand that conversation as having played out. We find it in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. Leave and go. I'm going to say something that's so obvious that I shouldn't have to say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. To go somewhere else, you have to leave where you are. Pretty straightforward. To go somewhere else, you have to leave where you are. And all I mean by that is you have to leave what's known. You have to leave what's comfortable. You have to leave what's predictable. You have to leave that sense of security that you have. This may be a geographical move, or it may just be a decision to move in a new direction to take a step of faith that you've never done before. And so to do so, you already feel a little bit of a churning anxiousness. You already feel like, oh, God, what are you telling me to do? This, is, this pushes me outside of my comfort zone. Uh, I'm very happy uh, now. I'm, I'm so thankful. I, I found a community of believers to be part of, and I, and I go there on Sunday mornings, and now you're saying you want me to take a step of faith and do something else. I'm already feeling uncomfortable with what this might be. But this is exactly what we're talking about today. To go somewhere else, to do this new thing, you have to leave where you are. You have to leave that area where you're very comfortable, perhaps, but it's very predictable. You have that security. I want you to consider to step towards your destiny in Christ. You may have to step away from that security. With Abraham, he, he, had to, he was called to leave his home. 
everything that he'd established. His family, his extended family, his immediate family went with him, but his extended family, he had a very small immediate family, he had no children. His, his traditions, the way he did things. Some of you have come out of other uh, belief systems and you've come now into faith in Christ, or at least you're considering it. And here you are today, either uh, around the world listening online or here at Innovation. And, and there's a transition taking place in your life. There's something new that God is doing. And sometimes it's material comfort. We get so comfortable. We, we know what we're going to do every evening. We know what's going to happen tonight. Some of you know exactly what you're going to do every evening this week. You have your couch you're going to sit on, or you have your, <laughs> guys, you have your remote control, or you have, whatever it may be that gives you the illusion of control in life. Uh, God is saying, well, wait a minute. I could, let, maybe, would you consider, would you consider the possibility of letting that get shaken up a little bit to go do something new, which means you're going to have to leave that area of comfort that you're already in. Well, this is what God is doing with Abraham. He makes a promise to Abraham, and he's ready to back it up. Again, we're back in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. In other words, whoever gives you a hard time, they're going to have to deal with me. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And of course, now we look back at history and we know that that's the case. But I would imagine when Abram first heard this, he's thinking, you're going to make out of me a great nation. How are you going to do that? My wife and I have no children, and I'm 75 years old. How is this going to happen? When does it begin? Lord, that ship has sailed. You know what I'm saying? And, and so he's thinking, you know, this can't possibly happen, but God is making him a promise. You know, a lot of us make promises to God. We've, how, how many of you have ever made a promise to God? Come on, let me be honest with you. You made a promise to God. Yeah, yeah, we make these promises. I remember my first promises that I ever made to God were before I knew God. I wasn't a Christian. In fact, I was a bit of a boozer and used drugs, and some of you know my story. And, um, and I made promises because I was driving under the influence, and I, the road was doing this. It was straight, but it was doing this to me. And I found myself, and I'm not, I'm not proud of this, I, and I'm not making fun of it. It's dangerous. But I, boy, did I pray. How many? Well, don't raise your hands. You know, but, but you just say, God, if you will just get me home. It never crossed my mind to just stop and pull on the side of the road because, you know, the elevator didn't go to the top floor. But if, if you will just get me home, I, I, I will never do this again. How many of you know that I never kept that promise? Never. No one keeps that promise. It's a promise we never keep. You know, it, 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 and, and many of us, being human, make bargains with God. We make our promises, but then nothing really comes out of those promises. And I bet that that's true for more of you in here than even are ready to admit it because it's a little embarrassing. And one of the things I've discovered, and I want you to really get this, all of the promises I ever made to God, even as a Christian, all of the promises I ever made to God never really changed me. Because we're not changed by making promises to God. We are changed by believing God's promises to us. That's what changes us, is our faith and trust and belief that when God says something, he means it, and then we act on it. That's where the transformation begins. And we find in verse 4 of Genesis chapter 12, so Abram left as the Lord had told him. That is, he acted in obedience to what he believed God was telling him to do. And I wonder what the world would be like if he did not 
Think about the influence, uh, not just in uh, Judaism, but in Christianity and in Islam and in every world religion and in, and in philosophy and in our understanding of the world as, as, as it is today. It would not be the same if he had not gone. And so also, there are blessings if you obey, and then there are things you miss if you don't. And this is true for all of us. To go somewhere else, you have to leave where you are. So here's one of the primary questions of this series, and it's in your notes, and I hope you'll consider it with me one more time. We'll put it up on the screen. What does God want you to want? What does God want you to want? For your story to be what you want it to be. As you're thinking today, and maybe if you haven't done it yet, you might write something in there or, or take some time later to write something down in there and say, well, Willie, really, really, what does God want me to want so that my story will be the story that I'll want to tell someone a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, the story of this season of your life? What does God want you to want? Write it in your notes. But it brings us to the second question. This one's new. And it's right below it in your notes. We'll put it on the screen as well. What step of faith do you need to take? What does God want you to want for the story to be what you want it to be? And then what step of faith do you need to take to see this unfold? There are so many stories that we have. And as you get older, you begin to share some of those stories. And hopefully we can share more of them. Uh, because we're excited at what God did during that season of your life or this other season of your life. And I know when I was a brand new Christian, 23 years of age, when I gave my heart to the Lord, the first big decision for me was to go public with my faith. I, I wanted to tell someone that I'd become a Christian. And who is it that you typically tell? You tell your family. You know, and so I did, and I told my family, and I love my family, and this is a long time ago, and they're all great. I'm going to say something that could be misunderstood, but they're all awesome. They probably don't even remember this, but I sure do, because the result of my telling my family that I had become a Christian was an intervention. I don't know if it was planned, but it took place where I got put in the back of a kitchen table against the wall, and all of the family was in front of me, and I could not get out, whether it was my, my brothers, my little sister was very young, my, my brothers and spouses, and they just, and because they, they wanted to do an intervention because I'd become religious, and that was something they didn't understand. The truth was I hadn't become religious. I've never been religious. I'm a follower of Christ. It has nothing to do with being religious, but I couldn't help them understand the difference. Uh, but, but they couldn't understand me mentioning the name of Jesus in any other way than as a curse word. And, and the drugs and the drinking, that they understood. I had my place in the family. I was the, I was the drunk, you know. I was the boozer. I was the drug user. I was the high school dropout. I mean, that was my role. I don't think anyone wanted me to stay there, but then all of a sudden I'm a follower of Christ and no one knew what to do with that. So when I first came out with my faith and began to share it, it created conflict. And then I went a step further and I did like we just saw a couple of wonderful folks do, a young man, young woman do just a moment ago, and that is I got baptized. And uh, I don't believe any of my family came other than my, my mom and my dad and my little sister. And all of them ultimately gave their hearts to the Lord. Not because they came to see me be baptized, but just, uh, just the sense that God was working in their lives. And he's working in the rest of my family as well. Please, I, 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 I'm not trying to be unkind in any way. I'm just trying to explain that there were decisions that had to be made. Let me give you a, a different kind of example. Uh, early on in my Christian walk, again, uh, the Lord is saying, okay, I want you to do something, which means I'm going to have to leave this comfort zone to do what God's, uh, you know, calling me to do. I've, I've decided to go do it. And I was working for a short time in a warehouse uh, trying to save money. I'm a new Christian. Dawn and I are going to get married. We're engaged and we're working. The, the summer before we got married, she worked in, in uh, Pittsburgh to earn money. I worked in New Jersey 
to earn money. So we didn't even see each other for months. Uh, and, um, and let me tell you, that works when you're getting ready to get married. Let me tell you, that works in a lot of ways. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> it just does, you know? So we were trying to save every penny we could. And, I, and, I, and so I'm working, and, and, and I'm driving. I didn't get to do it much, but I got to drive a forklift a little bit. It's a warehouse and other guys. But the thing is, is that I, I'm saying, well, OK, Lord, you're telling me to, to, to go and, 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 and share Christ with these people. And I really think that if I do, they're going to kill me. And, and I'm, I'm not kidding. I mean, we were talking about some, some very big, tough guys who would injure me. And so I thought, well, what could I do? And Dawn and I, earlier on, had had a whole box of Bibles, and they were in my possession at this point. And so I grabbed those Bibles, and I started finding out people's names anonymously, finding out people's names, and I'd write something in the front, the, you know, the area in the front of the Bible. I'd write, you know, to such and such, and, and then I'd write, uh, you know, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge God, and he will direct your steps. Praying for you, uh, and, and let me know if I can ever be any help, Charles. And I would close it, and I wrote it on all of those Bibles to different people, and I wrapped it in wrapping paper like it was a birthday present. And then on days when I was at work, which was every day, but I would find a guy, I'd make sure I'd get the right Bible to that guy, I'd give it to him, and they'd have this gift. And I probably did that 25, 30 times that summer. And the one story that always stands out was the most, was really the scariest of the guys. This was a guy who's <laughs> I don't know why, but his shirt was always unbuttoned to about almost his, his navel, his belly button, and all the hair piling out, and uh, muscles, and he's like six foot three, six foot four, no exaggeration, big guy, drove a forklift, wanted to hurt me, and, uh, and, and I gave him his Bible wrapped in a gift. He looked at it like it was poison. He says, what is this? And I said, well, it's a gift. It's for you. So it's not my birthday, it's, it's for you. And he opened it up and, 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 uh, and, and thankfully, he said, oh, it's a Bible. He didn't say anything. I, I see, God was, does his pre preparation work, you know. And, and he looked at it and he, and he opened it up. And I was so thankful that he did because then he could, he, he began to read uh, what I wrote in there. And he just started reading. I was so thankful that he knew how to read, actually. And so he actually read it. And he got to the bottom, and he closed it, and he looked at me, and I am not making this up, obviously. He began to weep, manly, but a couple of tears came down, and God was working. God was working in him. And from that point on, it was about sharing Christ and talking and reading verses, not just him, but a whole bunch of people. And the point is, I had to leave my comforts. I was not comfortable doing that. Would any of you be comfortable doing that? Unless you have the gift of evangelism or something, or you just like to talk to people all the time, you know, you're just not comfortable doing that. But God honored it, and he's honored it in the years since then. And I love telling the story because it's my story to tell. It was my season, you see. And God does that, and, and I want you to have stories to tell. When you went, God said, go, do that, talk to that person. And you, did, and, and you did it, and you did what God told you to do. And God has done that with Dawn and I, my wife and I, every step of our lives together, which is now well into its fourth decade. But whether it's education, we planted a church together. There was a years in the military when I was a chaplain. All of these steps, all of these stages, God gave us some direction. He said, I want you to do this. This is the next thing. And we never heard an audible voice, but we had that sense that the Holy Spirit was leading us. And God has honored us, and God has blessed us. The question then is, what about you? God has no favorites. He, he has, shows no partiality to anyone. God wants to be fully engaged in your life, directing your steps. And the question I would have for you is, what step of faith do you need to take? I'm not telling anyone to quit their job here, okay? Uh, maybe that's something God is speaking to you about, but he would have a, there'd be a plan, there'd be something that he's leading you toward. But that's not really what I'm getting at. Uh, you know, for example, many of you have gone to one of our life groups. You've been in a starting point group, and it blessed you. Or you were in the, uh, the bait group, uh, the bait of Satan group. 
and it blessed you, or you were in some other ministry, and it blessed you. And now what? Maybe the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, saying, listen, I want you to leave your comfort zone. I want you to start a group. I want you to facilitate a group. You've gone through it. You can do that here with just a, a, a few hours of, of instruction on how to facilitate a group, sitting with one of the pastors, even an hour talking about it, making sure you know what you're doing, and getting yourself uh, positioned to have a group in your home or one that meets here on campus. You say, well, I, I can't do that. Of course you can. God can do that through you. God can operate through you. You start Time to start a group. It's time to, to begin to... to, to speak into people's lives and to love them and, and to be ready to pray for them, encourage them. Maybe there's that job. Maybe, maybe you are in a job, you know, that it's time to move out of, but you haven't interviewed for anything else. Maybe it's time to go get in that interview. Maybe it's just vision for ministry. You know, a lot of the things that are done, in fact, everything that's done here at Innovation was someone's vision, not a pastor's vision, but just someone in the community of believers. We had uh, a couple of wonderful sisters in Christ, uh, um, uh, Myra and Kathleen, many of you know who they are, and they had a, 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 a vision for doing a ministry that would help to feed people who are going through a tough time. And ultimately, it became our food pantry. We feed over 500 people a month, and it's growing, and it continues to grow. Uh, uh, there, there was a, another woman named Robin, and now Amy has taken it over. We said, Look, why can't we get clothing for people? We, we have so much clothing. We have extra clothing. Well, can, well, how can we do that? And then now there's a clothing area on campus where you can go in and just, you don't have to pay anything. You just go in and find your size, find what you like, and grab some clothing. And that's something we do here. But the pastors didn't do it. It was something born from someone here. Uh, I think of Dawn Rack with the wonderful HK ministry, uh, you know, where she's going to hospitals and, and, and giving pouches filled with all kinds of crafts and, and fun things for children who are in the hospital because there were some people who blessed her when her kids were in the hospital. And that ministry has grown. It's all over Pennsylvania. In fact, it's going all over the country. But the office for that ministry is upstairs in our mezzanine where, where she has a room which you do not want to go in because it is just packed with everything HK, and that's where all the work's done. And, and, and I could go on. I could go on, whether it's a community dinner, other things that are happening here, ministries that are taking place. No one says, oh, let's do this. We, we have a, a staff meeting among pastors and say, we now need to do this. No, it's the community of believers as the Holy Spirit breathes upon you, breathes upon you. I mean, it's awesome that you're here on a, on a Sunday morning. It's awesome. But God has so much more for you to do, to be involved in, with kids or with youth or with all the various ways that you can serve and evangelize and helping and be a part of, the, of, of what God is doing. Some of you have wonderful skills in writing. Maybe it's time to start writing those notes down. And, and you know, I, when I wrote, I wrote a book, I have a couple of books published and I, I plan to do some more writing. Mine started as little scraps of paper so big stuffed into an envelope. <laughs> Now listen, this is going to sound very egotistical, and I don't mean it to be, and maybe it's not such a big deal anyhow, but those little pieces of paper stuffed into an envelope eventually got put into separate envelopes as they seemed to come up with different ideas. Those became chapters, and that's a book that now is, is somewhere between 40, 45,000 copies sold. Okay, and that's, that's, one, that's, a, that's a textbook used at universities and colleges around the, around the country, around the world. It's been translated into Korean, translated into China. It starts with a little piece of paper. Starts with a thought, thoughts, starts with an idea. May some of you are sitting on a gold mine of wisdom that God has given to you. Maybe it's time to write a few things down. Some of you are just awesome parents, but maybe it's time to foster. You know, maybe saying our time is done. No, you could foster a child or you could adopt another child. Maybe, and we have others, we have a number of people in the congregation doing that and desiring to do more. Missions trip, there's always an opportunity to go somewhere. We will support that. You know we do. You know, we'll try to help you raise funds so you can get to that missionary opportunity and, and get that experience of supporting a mission trip. And then in the most mundane of ways, you might say, well, why does he even have to say this? I say this for John and, and all of the young people. And I, but sometimes you just got to go ask her on a date. <laughs> you just got to do it. 
You just got to do it. When I, when I saw Dawn, <laughs> my wife, and we were in this college campus, and we were in this little felly area where they served greasy burgers, and I looked across, and just about where my daughter is and my, and my daughter-in-law are, are, are sitting right about now, I could see her over there in a crowd of people, and I'd seen her in a class, and I, and I looked over, and I thought, oh, no, I can't talk to her. I, I, might, I might get embarrassed. I might, I might, you know, she might reject me. She should have. She might reject me. <laughs> No, I, I wasn't thinking like that. I was just like, like a magnet, man. I was drawn. I walked right over to her. I didn't even see the other people. The waters parted for me. And I got right over to her. And, and, uh, and she looked at me, and I acted like I'd known her forever, and we started talking. Eventually, I walked her back. Some of you have heard me say this before, but I walked her back to her campus, uh, to her dorm. And on the way back, I, I, I said, you know, I'd really like to see you again. She said she had a boyfriend. <laughs> I don't even believe it. I said, and you know what I said. I said, you need to dump him and go out with me. And she did, and we've been together ever since. And so that's the goal. It's just a cool story, and I like telling the story. It's, but I had, to, I had to take a little step because you've got to ask yourself, and the only reason I tell the story is you have to say, why don't we do it? You know, if you have good heart, good motives, you want to love people, you want to encourage people, and then we don't do it. And it's usually because we're afraid of, of failure or we're afraid of ridicule. We just aren't sure of ourselves. That's not so good, so, so, such a, a bad thing. God gives grace to the humble, right? He'll resist the proud, so that's not such a bad thing if you're not sure of yourself. But what gets to be a problem is, I'll do it later. That gets to be a problem. I'm too busy. Because it can start to feel a little bit more like uh, I'm a little too lazy or I'm, I'm too selfish and I'm too focused on me. So, so you have to ask yourself, I want to finish up, uh, how did Abraham do it? Abraham did it by faith, by faith. Listen to it, it takes faith to please God. Hebrews 11.8, this is the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, t talking about the very story that we've been talking about here this morning. Chapter 11, verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as, in, as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. He simply went. And so our story is, by faith, I decided to go. By faith, I decided to do that. By faith, I, to start, I decided to start this ministry. By faith, I decided to help this person. By faith, I decided to, uh, to tell people I'm a Christian at work or to share my testimony. Or to, uh, by faith, I decided to do this. By faith, I decided to do that. And God begins to do something because fear says stay, faith says go. And a lot of people will say, well, I, you know, I, I don't have the faith to do all of that. It's this big thing, you know, but... That's not what faith is about. Faith, you only need to have enough faith to get started. You know, once I started walking over toward dawn in that way back then, those years ago, I only needed faith to do one or two steps, and then my body just kind of propelled itself the rest of the way. But life is like that. You need enough faith to make the phone call. You need enough faith to, to, to tell that person, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start this ministry, or enough faith to, to call that adoption agency, or enough faith to, to call foster, or enough faith to whatever it may be. And the Lord's laying it uniquely on your heart, enough faith to say, you know what, I could, I could facilitate a group. I enjoyed that group. I could facilitate it for others. I could do it in my home and get to know people. We could open up or I could do it on campus. You don't have to have the faith to finish, just the faith to get started. Take the first step. I don't believe when I began back in 1975 that I ever thought of having faith to live my life for Christ. I had the faith to begin. I had the faith to start. And the rest unfolded as the Holy Spirit has been leading me. And it's no different for you. It's no different. I'm going to ask the band to come on up. And as they do, I want to remind each of us, Abraham had to make a decision, right? Uh, if we could miss that. But ultimately, he had to choose. He had to make a decision. Somebody once said, the truth is, is you're not going to be able to walk on water unless you get out of the boat, right? You have to step out by faith to find out what's going to happen. 
And one day you're going to tell a story about this season of your life. What do you want that story to be? I want you to be able to tell a story that you're proud to tell. So again, one last time, the decisions you make today determine the stories you'll tell tomorrow. And sometimes the best decision you can make is to go when it would have been easier to stay. How do we tell a story that's worth telling? The story you want to tell. You let God help you write that story. The author and perfecter of our faith. And you say, Lord, I decided to go to take that step of faith. And you watch and see what God is going to do. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We thank you for the abundance of your grace. And we recognize apart from you we can do nothing, but in and through you all things are possible. And Lord, we come before you right now and we ask that you would move in our lives and in our hearts as we say, Lord, whatever it is you want me to do, uh, I am, I, I'm pretty comfortable the way things are right now, but I'm willing to go. I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to start it. I'm willing to go to that person, begin that ministry, or do that group. I'm willing to go wherever you send me on that mission trip, on the mission, back to school, whatever it may be. Lord, I am just making myself available to you today. And I'm making a declaration today to do what you direct me to do. No, right now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a step of faith. I'm going to ask you to open your eyes and look at me. This is a step of faith on my part. Everyone who would say, I'm prepared to, to go when it would be easier to stay. I'm not even sure what that go means to you. But I'm prepared to go even though it would be easier to stay. I want to see your hands go up right now. Hands going up everywhere. Look at that. Look at that. Just look around you. I wanted to open eyes so you would see God is working in everybody's life. This is not just something that is just you. This is about what God does in his people's lives. Amen. Father, we thank you for the hands raised. We know, Lord, each one is a story that's going to be told. Each one is a story that's going to honor and glorify you. And Lord, I know that there are a couple here, maybe a few. I don't know who they are, but maybe there's a decision that they need to make first. And that is a decision to say yes to you. That you would enter into their lives and change them and transform them at the deepest part of who they are. That they would be forgiven and be able to start their lives as followers of Christ. Not to become religious, but to be led by your Holy Spirit. To recognize the assurance of what it is to be right with you. To be blessed. If that's you this morning, pray with me. Because we're going to be done in just a minute. The band's going to play. This is your moment. And say, Father, I want that assurance. I want to live my life with you. And so I receive your son, Jesus, who has reconciled me to you, who has restored me into a relationship with you, Father, who has forgiven me so that I might live my life as a new creation, as a follower of Christ. Fill me with your Holy Spirit Make this so real that my life would pivot today from one direction to a new direction as I follow you. I ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. Come on, let's give the Lord some praise. He's worth it. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Would you, would you stand with me? I want to say one more thing before the band plays. Uh, they're going to do a song that is just so awesome. It's a, it's just, it's an old song, and yet it's been updated a little bit. It's called Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. And so I don't know if you noticed a moment ago, I, want, I was saying, I want you to have that assurance. I want you to know that you know that you know that you belong to the Lord. We're going to have some folks, in fact, I'm going to ask them to come up right now, standing right here in front, and they're going to be available to you. And you say, I want that assurance 
with Christ. I want that assurance. Well, then just come. You don't have to, but we encourage you to come and tell one of these folks that are up front uh, and, and just say, listen, I'm, you pray with me. And uh, we would love to do that. Now, you can come up for any reason. You have a physical need. You have whatever relational need, financial need. You can also, please, come up. Let someone pray with you. We also have the Lord's Supper here where you take the bread and dip it in the cup and take it and just spend some time in the Lord's presence. Anything we can do to facilitate for you that God is getting a hold of you and taking you that next step. Taking you that next step. Amen. So let's all begin to sing and worship the Lord. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. But take a step of faith as well. Won't you let this day be a, a, a pivotal day, a deciding day for you. God bless you.
you're here this morning um, and you decided to make that decision for Christ, you decided for the first time to follow Jesus, um, I just pray that you would come and pray with somebody, that you'd be able to speak to someone. Um, in the front of your chair, there's this card that says decision. It's not a magical card. Um, nothing supernatural happens when you fill this out, but it is a step. Like Pastor was talking about going, it is the first step. It's a step of faith to write down, I made that decision today. I want to let you know. Take this to the back table, and when you bring it back there, they have a free gift for you. And in here, there is a Bible. There's some papers that are going to help you on this incredible life-changing journey. Um, and this card will go to the pastors, and they want to pray for you. They want to help you in any way possible on this incredible journey that you're starting. Um, and I can tell you uh, from experience that it is a life-changing journey. It is one that you want to take with your Savior. So I just encourage you this morning to do that. And let's, uh, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, that you have spoken to our hearts today, Lord God. You have spoken to us about the areas in our lives, Lord, that we need to go. Lord, and I just pray that you continue to speak to us as we leave this place, Lord God. Continue to speak to our hearts, Father. I just pray for each and every person here, Lord, that you would just bless them in a mighty way, Lord. That they would just be your light this week as they go through their life. I thank you for it. We praise in the, in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, have a wonderful week, church. Have a wonderful week. Have a blessed week.